Public television is home to some of the country's top culinary stars. This pesto keeps quite well. So hang on to your cooking tongs. We're bringing six of them together for a progressive dinner. These are the world's greatest grilled cheese sandwiches. And some mouth-watering fun. Coming up, starting right now. I think it's time to actually talk to the people out there. What do you think? I think so. <laughs> Hi, I'm Chris Kimball. I'm here with some of my favorite cooks and chefs. Actually, they're so good, I'm not quite sure how I got invited to this party. But I'm here, first. and uh, welcome. Well, you know, this is a rare occasion, a rare opportunity to get all these characters all together. They're characters? Great. Characters. You're calling them yeah. characters? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you have it in you. Good, but they can produce a good recipe, a good plate. And what's going to come out of here, I think, if we all do, it's going to come a movable feast, a progressive dinner. I love that. All so, right. you know, I'm going to I'm going to start it off if I may okay. cuz you can't have a great dinner without cocktails, right? Count so me in. I'm going to make a ginger syrup and from that make two east-west cocktails. We're going to do a ginger tahito using Thai basil and mm -hmm. in honor of you, Rick, a ginger margarita. Oh, right. Wow. Wow. I think you can never have too many appetizers. So, right. I'm going to make two of my favorite really easy appetizers. This really spicy shrimp curry that you wrap up in lettuce leaves, and you take a bite, and it just blows your head off. They, okay. They're nice. great. They'll go great with your cocktail. So you're stepping on my and toes The again. next one is the best grilled cheese sandwich you've ever had. Oh, in yeah. Your yeah. Life. Everybody yeah. loves that. And and you you know, I have to follow that with pasta. You know, you guys sort yeah. of elected Absolutely. me. Absolutely. And I'm going to make a pasta that maybe you never had in your life. Spaghetti trapanese, pesto trapanese from Trapanese. Uh, I love the name. Trapanese. Yeah. Uncooked sauce. For spaghetti. If you're so, going to take us to Italy, I'm going to take us on a little virtual tour of Mexico. Oops. I'm going to make these really great enchiladas from one of my very favorite places, downtown Mexico City. And they do these creamy chicken filled enchiladas. I'm there. Well, like, you got to say enchilada. That was good. Enchiladas. Enchiladas. That's really cute. <laughs> okay, we are talking here yeah, Italy, China, Mexico, America, the world. I have to do Spain. And I'm going to make lomo de cerdo a la sal. Loin of pork baked in salt. No chilies? <laughs> Let me think about it. No, no chilies today. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to do something purely American now, because all these people are international. Dessert? I'm doing dessert. All right. I'm going to do an apple pie, but I'm going to do it in a skillet. Wow. Just a top crust. It's actually much easier. OK, lots of and, apples? And Yes, lots of apples. Wow. It's a mock apple pie. There you go. It's oh. a skillet apple pie. Listen to this. I can't get a word in edgewise. No, no, you can't. You know, this, sounds, this sounds really good. But we are dividing, we are conquering, yeah. and we're going to do a progressive dinner. And it's going to be wonderful. That's it's exciting. Great. So we I need to get to the kitchen soon. Because I think this is really going to be an amazing menu. And it's guaranteed. Here we go. This is like, but um, <laughs> to be a movable. So, so let's, let's go. move. move. Let's go. Hey, Vamanos. Ming, do you need help with the cocktails? Yeah, I do need help. Good, because I love cocktails. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is Ming Sai from Simply Ming. Let's get this party started. How do we do that? With some cocktails. All right, now first we're going to make the base of this cocktail is ginger syrup. Great ginger. <laughs> Ginger should be hard like that. It should have no bruises on it. And let me show you the best way to peel it. You can take off the nubs with a knife. I like to use the spoon. Look how easy this is, guys. Just with the spoon, you can take the skin right off. The skin is bitter, so that's why you want to take it out. We're making a ginger syrup with three ingredients. Ginger, sugar, and water. That's it. And once you have the ginger syrup, you can make two incredibly tasty cocktails. We're going to do a Thai Hito using ginger syrup. That's a rum drink. And the second one, we're going to make a tequila drink, a margarita. All right. So you take this ginger, super thinly sliced, because the more surface area you get out of ginger, the more flavor you're going to get out of it. So with this, and I have a whole bunch of ginger here, into a pot, we're basically making a simple syrup. What's simple syrup? Well, it's ginger, it's sugar, 
and it's water. So we mix all this together. Very simple, guys. This recipe is basically done. Stir it all together till the sugar dissolves, and you bring this to a simmer. And once it comes to a simmer, you let it reduce by about 50% until you have a pancake syrup consistency. It's going to get nice and dark, and you can actually take a spoon and put it on a cold plate to see if it holds a line. Once it comes to a rolling boil like this, turn it down. You want a nice simmer, and then this you just want to go nice and slow to about 50% reduction. So after about 25 minutes or so, you end up with ginger syrup that looks like this. Look how beautiful, dark, golden brown it is. All right, so this is done. Now, key here to keep building flavor is you let this chill. This is the cooled stuff, and you put it on a plate. See how it draws that line? Pancake syrup consistency. That's what you want. Are you going to throw this ginger away? No way, Jose. Why? We're going to make ginger candy. All right, so once you strain this out, Again, it's much easier to do this candy once it's chilled. Use your spatula, get all the ginger syrup out of there. All right, really work it. It smells delicious. And by the way, this stuff is great. If you happen to have someone that you know that has nausea because of pregnancy or whatnot, feed them ginger candy or feed them ginger tea. So now I'm dumping this into a, just a big pot of just plain sugar. Now here, let's go ahead and mix this all up. Got to get a little dirty here. All I'm doing is mixing and breaking up all the ginger and coating it completely with sugar. And this is then going to go into a very low oven, 180, 200 degrees. You can go overnight to dry this out. And once it's dried out, you have ginger candy, all right? So this comes to a board, and you just lay them out like this. And it's delicious. Kids love it. You can also use it to stir fry with later on. So it's great to have some sweet ginger. All right, you get the idea there. Once you lay it out, then it goes, like I said, into an oven. You end up with ginger candy. It looks like this. See how nice and dry it is? Ah, so good. So good. All right, let's go ahead and use now this ginger syrup and make our first cocktail using what we use here at Blue Ginger. It's a traditional cocktail shaker. Put a little ice. Get it ready. Then we're going to first do what we're calling the Thai Hito. What do you need for that? Well, we're using Thai basil leaves, six to eight leaves. We're going to muddle this, all right? We're going to take a little mint, which is traditional in a mojito, but we're doing a Thai hito. We're going to take a couple slices of lime. We're going to muddle this, so just a couple like this. That goes in, and then a little bit of sugar. Take your muddler, and muddling is just this action. You're really trying to build flavors. You're basically getting the juice out. You're getting the, uh, out of the zest, the flavor of the lime, and you're getting the good oils out of the mint and the Thai basil. All right, now to this, we're gonna add some great rum, a couple ounces of rum. This is from Bermuda, one of my favorites. Then we're gonna add some of this wonderful ginger syrup. Why don't we use ginger syrup I have here? Just like that, not too much. And then we have our ice. All right, then this, you take and you really shake it well. You really need to mix this. This is the key. Yes, any bartender, you want to break and make the ice crystals into small pieces to really chill it out. And here we have a nice rock glass. Now, check this out. How do you get this out? You just find where the cup hits the glass and just give it just one hit like that. All right, it's not as hard as you think. Pour this in. And then a little splash of soda on top. Look at that. How good does that look? Last but not least, we're going to take just a little lime, a little lime garnish like that. And because we have some beautiful Thai basil, garnish it that way. There we go, guys. A beautiful Thai hito made with rum. All right, let's go ahead and get our second drink. Equally delicious. It is a margarita, so that means tequila and using, of course, our ginger syrup. So first you take some 100% agave tequila. Make sure it's 100% agave. Into the ice. To this, I'm gonna add a little bit more ice into this. I'm gonna add some fresh lime juice, all right? This is juice of two limes. The ratio should be two to one. Two parts tequila, two parts lime juice, one part sweetener. And our sweetener is our delicious ginger syrup, all right? 
So then this, again, really get a good ice crystallization in it. All right, this is good to go. Here's one trick. Martini glass with ice water. Why? Because you want to uh, have a super cold martini glass. Now, a little garnish for this. What are we doing here? We're taking salt, adding sugar to the salt, adding some cuchicado, which is a great, great chili flake. Mixing this, this adds a little bit of spice because the ginger gives you a second level of spice. Take a lime, just rim it all the way around, and then pour a little bit of this on a plate. Spread that out. You get a nice colorful rim. Look at that, all right? Now to that, we then add our margarita straight in. Look how good does that look. Garnish it with a beautiful lime wedge. And if you have it, because you made your ginger syrup, your ginger candy, and there you have it, a ginger margarita and a tajito. Now let's go check out a great friend and fantastic foodie, Ruth Reichel. I'm Ruth Reichel from Gourmet's Diary of a Foodie and I love appetizers. This is the first thing that your guests are gonna eat. So it's really important that you give them something that's just gonna knock them out. So I'm gonna show you two incredible appetizers that are very easy. And the first one is nothing but the world's best grilled cheese sandwich. Really good bread, great onions, and terrific cheese. And you have something that people will never forget. We're gonna start with leeks, scallions, red onions, shallots, garlic, sweet onions, and white onions. I've already cut them up, and we're going to mix these all up and I'm gonna take a third of a cup of this mixed onions, and I'm gonna throw in the scallions and the garlic. And so what you get is something that has real powerful flavor. Um, and you're not gonna believe what this does to a grilled cheese sandwich. You have only bread and cheese and onions in this, so you really want everything to be of the very best quality. Americans are making really good cheese these days, and you really want to support our local artisans. So it's a little messy, but um, that's part of the fun of cooking. And then you're gonna take, you're gonna sprinkle this onion mixture. This is enough for four sandwiches, so I'm just gonna make two here. And you wanna spread it sort of evenly and close your sandwich up. And then you want to put just a little bit of butter on the outside too, just to help it, just to help it be even more delicious. Then we're just gonna plunk these onto the grill. We're gonna flip it over because we want both sides to be really crusty. We're gonna let this cook for another three or four minutes so that it's something that is irresistible. We're gonna take this off the grill now. And now we just cut these into little squares that make perfect little finger foods. Just lovely little tidbits for people. I think you'll find, no matter who you serve these to, people might say, oh, it's just grilled cheese sandwich until they taste it. And then they'll go, oh, this is the best grilled cheese sandwich I've ever had in my life. They look absolutely delicious. And now we're ready to make our other appetizer. Spices are the centerpiece of this next appetizer. This is an appetizer that has lots of really exotic, fragrant flavors. It's got chiles, it's got turmeric, it's got cumin, it's got coriander. It's a wonderful explosion of flavors. You start by just putting a little bit of oil into a pan, just a couple of tablespoons. You wanna cover the bottom of the pan. Throw in serrano chiles, garlic, and ginger. And then we add the magic ingredient, which is curry leaves. Curry leaves have 
nothing to do with curry. They are a wonderful aromatic leaf that is like the bay leaf of Southeast Asia. We're gonna add coriander. It is, you've, you've had it green, you've had the leaves. Um, they're, they're, it's cilantro. And these are mustard seeds, and you're gonna throw them in, and it's what ordinary mustard is made of. And you're gonna wait for them to pop, and when they pop, you know you're ready. This is turmeric. Turmeric is what gives curry powder its color, and it's gonna color this dish beautifully and give it a little bit of flavor. And then finally, we're gonna add cumin. So you're gonna cook this for about a minute, and you'll start to hear the mustard seeds popping, and the scent of that coriander and cumin is now really rising up. Okay, the next thing is we're going to add salt, and pepper and a lot of onions because the onions are really going to give this some body. And we're going to cook this for about four minutes until the onions get a little bit soft. The last thing we're going to add is coconut and tomatoes. And this is how you know that you're in South India, this combination of all of these spices and these chilies. And coconut and tomato. And we need this to soften, so we're gonna cover this and cook it four to six minutes until everything sort of cooks together into a wonderful aromatic melange of flavors. Oh, look at that, it is beautiful. And now we're gonna add the shrimp. Now I like to keep my shrimp cold. They're wonderful, small American shrimp. American shrimp are sustainable and Many shrimp are not, so you really want to get American shrimp, and you want to make sure that you don't overcook them. And you know when shrimp are cooked, they show you. It's one of the foods that is kind enough to actually shout when they're cooked. When they start turning pink, they lose that translucent quality, they're cooked. They're changing color, and they're sort of starting to tighten up a little bit. Now, this looks really done, but what you really want to do is just reach in and taste one. Perfect. So we're going to take it off the heat and let it cool down. And then this is what it looks like when it's ready to serve. And what's great about this is it's interactive. So it gives people something to do. And you just, you take a lettuce leaf, you wrap it up, you wrap the shrimp into the lettuce leaf, you make this nice, neat little package, and then you eat it, but you leave a little bit for your guests. Hi, I'm Lydia Bastianich of Lydia's Italy. And what am I bringing to the table for our movable feast? Well, how do spaghetti and pesto trapanese sound? Trapanese means it's from the Sicilian town of Trapani. So it's a pesto that reflects that region with cherry tomatoes, almonds, and a spicy kick from pepperoncino flakes. That's right, pesto, that versatile sauce you whip up in the blender or food processor and never have to cook can be many things. One of the most familiar pestos is pesto la genovese. And to make pesto la genovese, you need garlic, basil, toasted pine nuts, some parsley, olive oil, you put all of that in a blender, get a nice thin sauce like that. Then you cook your pasta, toss it with the sauce, add the cheese, and you got yourself a great Genovese dish, a Ligurian dish. Then another simple comes from Emilia Romagna, this one right here. Put garlic, walnuts, roughly chop them, and then you add ricotta to that, just like right here. You mix it all together like this. You cook the pasta in the meantime, toss this with the boiled pasta, a little bit of butter and cheese, and you got yourself another great dish. But now let me show you the pesto alla trapanese. By the time the pasta, in this case the spaghetti cooks, we will have the pesto done and we'll be ready to enjoy. A pot of boiling water, 
Salt it, don't break the spaghetti. The us Italians like our spaghetti full size. So while the pasta is cooking, we'll make the pesto trapanese from Sicily. Naturally, a little garlic goes in there. Ripe tomatoes, cherry tomatoes. If you don't have cherries, uh, the regular tomatoes, find a nice meaty ripe tomato. And we'll add the almonds and you can leave skin on. I like it. A little peperoncino or as much as you'd like. Some salt. Basil leaves. Some parsley leaves. And olive oil. Okay, so that's done. A nice serving platter. Let's check on the pasta. Okay, a few more minutes. The one important thing about pesto is that you do not cook it. So cook the pasta, drain the pasta, and then dress it with the fresh pesto because what you want out of pesto is exactly that freshness. I think the pasta is cooked by now. Yes, perfect. Don't drain it too much because we need a little bit of liquidity in tossing this pasta. I think, yes, I think it's all here. Naturally, when the pasta is hot, hot, that's when you want to dress it. And you see here, I have an abundant amount of pesto. This pesto keeps quite well. As a matter of fact, most pestos do. Keep it in the refrigerator, even freeze it. A little bit of olive oil. Mm. The aromas coming out of this are just wonderful. Uh, the basil, the garlic, just the freshness. And I think this is enough dressing as it is. You can always put a little bit of a pesto on the table and let them uh, help themselves. What you need here now is just grated cheese to bind it all together. And certainly you can use uh, grana, parmigiano. In Sicily they use also pecorino because uh, it is the land of the sheep rather than the cow. Mm. Perfect. Mm. Nice warm plate. And you make a nest. Put the pasta down and give it a twist. And the nest is not just for aesthetic or visual, it is when you tighten the pasta like that, it retains its heat. Okay, a little bit of sauce, just put a little bit of sauce right here, but I think it has, it has all the sauce, maybe a drizzle of oil, mm -mm -mm. and a basil leaf just to bring forth the flavors that are in there. You know, this is a great dish whether you do it quickly or for any feast, it really merits the most festive of tables. Now let me taste it. Mm. Delicioso. A little tanginess of the peperoncino. The almonds come through under the, the teeth. A little acidity from the tomatoes. It's just such a harmonious, harmonious dish, full of flavor and easy to make. Next. I'm going to pass the plate to my dear friend, Rick Bayless from Chicago, who's whipping up the next course in our movable feast.
Hi, I'm Rick Bayless from Mexico, one plate at a time. And adding to our movable feast, I've got this great entree. It's called Enchiladas Especiales, special enchiladas from Cafe Tacuba in downtown Mexico City. This is a place that's been around since 1912. They're creamy, they're spicy, and they're covered with melted cheese. And I start by roasting a couple of these beautiful poblano peppers. And then when they're all blackened and blistered on the outside, I let them cool down till they're handleable and rub off all of that blackened skin, tear them open, pull out the seed pod, brush out all the seeds and rinse them briefly, and then roughly chop all of these roasted poblanos. And I'm gonna get together the rest of the ingredients for the sauce. I've got some spinach here, some milk. Grab a little bit of broth out of the cupboard there. And I'm gonna take a good handful of this spinach and add it to the roasted poblanos. I'm gonna put them all together into the blender jar. Scoop up these, oh, that smells so good. Now, for the base of the sauce, that white sauce that I was talking about there, I'm going to take a little bit of butter and melt that into a large saucepan over kind of a medium heat there. And then into another saucepan, I'm gonna combine equal parts of milk and chicken broth. I'm gonna warm the broth and milk mixture. When the butter is completely melted, I'm gonna add a little bit of chopped garlic to it, stir it around until it's really aromatic. That takes about a minute. Add some flour, stir it to combine. Then add the warm broth and milk mixture and whisk it until it comes to a full boil and thickens. Reduce the heat to medium and let it simmer for about five minutes and take it off the heat. I'm gonna give this a little salt, whisk that in, then pour about half of this white sauce mixture into the poblanos and spinach. Secure the top onto the blender, but because hot mixtures expand in the blender, we don't wanna blow the top off. So I'm gonna remove that center part and put a doubled up towel on there, then blend this mixture until it's as smooth as I can get it. It's a beautiful color of green. I'm gonna take this mixture and put it back in with the base of the white sauce. Whisk that all together and we're on to the tortillas. I've got a dozen corn tortillas here that I'm going to divide up onto a baking sheet by twos. Then with spray, I like to use the oil spray, I'm going to spray both sides of each tortilla. Then the tortillas go into a 350 degree oven for three or four minutes just to warm them through, bring them back out, stack them all together to keep them warm. Now to fill these enchiladas, I have some coarsely shredded rotisserie chicken and to top them a little bit of grated cheese. Now of course we're gonna need these warm tortillas and our sauce to work with as well. I'm gonna take about a cup full of this beautiful garlicky green roasted poblano spinach sauce and mix that into the chicken. And once that's all mixed together, that'll season it nicely. Then we're ready to form these enchiladas. I'm gonna take one of these beautiful terracotta individual baking dishes, put just a little bit of the sauce over the bottom of it, and then roll three enchiladas, a little of our shredded chicken filling, roll that up and nestle that down in. 
a bit more filling in a second one. Once you've got three of them, then a little sauce over the top covering them from end to end so that there's no tortilla get hard in the oven. And I'm going to sprinkle a little bit of this grated Chihuahua style cheese and it's ready to go into the oven. Wow. I can hardly talk my mouth is watering so much. Up next, another tasty dish from my friend Jose Andres. I am Jose Andres and I'm the host of Made in Spain. And you and I, we're gonna make a very unique and simple dish. Cerdo a la sal. Pork loin, baking salt. This is the easiest recipe to surprise anyone, even yourself. What we need over here is pork loin. Simple, you can find this anywhere. And another ingredient that is really, really difficult to find, salt. Yes, with pork loin and salt and your favorite herbs, you can make a dish quick. So let me show it to you. We're gonna get water. And what we're gonna be doing is mixing water with the salt. Why are we doing this? Well, it's kind of simple to understand. If you see the salt, kind of is very loose. But in the moment we put the water in, we are gonna mix the water and the salt into a paste. Take a look. Now, it's like a snowball, this time with salt. Great, we are ready to go. We're gonna do like a bed right here on the tray, like this doesn't need to be very thick. Perfect. And you're gonna be asking me, Jose, how big this bed has to be? Well, you take a look at the loin, and what do you think? I think this is uh, the perfect size. So the only thing we need to be doing is placing the poor loin on top of the salt. But if actually you wanna give an extra flavor, you know what you do? Hmm. You get parsley. Parsley is one of my favorite herbs. And you put the parsley right here on top of the salt. And then you can put also, why not, rosemary. And then you can put also some thyme. Let's say for a second you don't like thyme, rosemary, and parsley. No problem. You can put any herb you like. That's the great thing about this recipe. Perfect. And then we put the loin on top. And why not? We can also cover the pork loin with more herbs, like this. <laughs> Great. I love these kind of very simple, quick recipes. And now we need to cover the pork loin with the remaining salt. All right. You know, the only thing really is making sure that the entire loin is really covered, like this. Beautiful. Great. This is finished. Now let's go to the oven. You know, when my friends ask me, Jose, what can I cook with my children at home? This is really the perfect recipe. Well, 25 minutes in a 400 Fahrenheit oven. And well, we can enjoy life. Wow, don't tell me that this pork loin doesn't look wonderful. It smells so good. Now, the only thing you need to do is, well, crack the salt. And wow, take a look at this pork loin with all the aroma of the rosemary, the thyme, the parsley. Beautiful. All right. You know, make sure that the pork loin rests. I have to tell you, in Spain, we love naps. After a nap, you feel wonderful. Well, I wanna believe that this pork feels very much like us. If you give rest to the pork, 
it's gonna feel so much better and at the end it's gonna be so tasty and besides that well all the juices are not gonna be running out of uh, the meat so it's a win-win take a look at this slice it's very tender very soft only the salt and the pork wow you see you see all the juices are running out perfect we really did an exceptional job here all right because I am kind of a guy that likes uh, the meat thick, I'm gonna cut the rest very thick. We put the thick slices right here, and then these thin ones right there. And you know, you're gonna be telling me, Jose, what can I serve with this beautiful pork? Ha! I'm telling you, you're gonna be amazed because I do believe, I really believe that the best garnish for this pork well, it's more pork. Let me introduce you. Jamón serrano. This is a cured ham that is salted and then air dry for over a year in Spain. And I can tell you, you see these slices with the beautiful fat in between the meat, very marble. Well, in the moment we're gonna start placing these slices in between the meat, the fat is gonna start melting. And you say, you keep putting layer after layer as much or as little as you want. But the important thing here is that all the aromas of this jamón serrano mingle with the pork loin and at the end what we have is well a fresh pork and a dry pork talking to each other and really creating an excellent dish i love the aroma of fresh herbs with the meat and to finish well no salt i think we had enough salt to make this dish but my magic ingredient olive oil from spain drizzle the oil on top and this dish is really ready. Don't tell me this is not an easy dish, I think. <laughs> We're gonna really surprise my friends with this. Yeah. Even the great chefs of Europe would have a hard time making the perfect apple pie. It looks good on the outside, you slice in and it falls apart, the apples are half cooked, and the bottom crust is soggy, and there's that annoying space between the top of the crust and the apples. Almost impossible to do. In fact, it makes a French apple tart look like a piece of cake. So let's go into the test kitchen with Julia and figure out a whole new way to cook apples and crust, and we're gonna start with a skillet. I know you, you love making pies. So you're like the pie man. Um, is that it? Yeah. Is that, my tombstone. <laughs> Here lies the pie man. <laughs> if you're lucky. <laughs> it was lies was the operative word in that. So that was one cup of all-purpose flour. We're going to add just a tablespoon of sugar. Okay. Make it a little sweet. And a quarter teaspoon of salt. And we're going to pulse those together. Okay. All right, so we're gonna add some butter and shortening, but it's always good to keep them chilled because they incorporate a little more easily and they don't really melt. We're gonna add two tablespoons of shortening, and that's about 10 pulses, just till it starts to break down. The good thing about shortening is even when it's warm, as it is here today, it doesn't change, it doesn't start to melt on you. So. Nope, and this is six tablespoons of chilled butter, and notice we've cut it into nice little pieces, and by cutting it smaller to start, of course it's easier to incorporate. Shortening, make sure it's really flaky and tender. Butter adds flavor. Let's take a look and see what we got. Starting to look a little like cornmeal with some bigger butter pieces in there. That looks pretty good. So we can dump it into this bowl. And we're gonna add the liquid or the water by hand. And again, this ensures that you don't overwork the dough. So now we're gonna add water. We're gonna add it a couple tablespoons at a time. We're gonna start with two tablespoons. It can really take anywhere up to four or so. Five if it's a super dry day. And you really wanna just press the water in. You want to form this into a dough. I think this is going to take at least one more. Now this is coming together nicely, you can see. Just keep pressing it in. You're not stirring it, you're really pressing it, and that's helping make those flaky layers. Well, it also helps to mix that water in the dough, so that's you don't right. end up adding too much. So onto the plastic wrap, and this is when I just take the edges of the plastic wrap, and you can really pat it into a round. And we're gonna let this chill for at least an hour, but of course you can make this a day or two in advance if you wanted to. 
All right, so now we're gonna get started on the filling while that dough is gonna finish chilling. And the one great thing about doing a skillet apple pie is there's no bottom crust, so we can make that filling really juicy. And we tried apple juice in water, but this apple cider had by far more flavor. And we tried different kinds of sugars, brown sugars, white sugars, maple syrup, Awesome. Mm. So I mean, we also tried molasses to a lot of the older recipes. That's did. what they had for flavoring. It's mm -hmm. just too dark. Yeah, yeah too time. overpowering. But the maple syrup was a little more gentle and just added a wonderful, well rounded, complex flavor. So that was half a cup of cider, and that's a third of a cup of maple syrup, about two tablespoons of fresh lemon juice. And then to thicken it all up, we're going to add two teaspoons of cornstarch. So, of course, we're going to whisk the cornstarch in to dissolve it. And we're going to Set this sauce aside until we're ready to add it to our skillet. We should just say in a normal pie, if you added that much liquid, oh, the yeah. bottom crust would be a disaster. So it you, be get, so you get a great sauce out of this, mm -hmm. which is really important. Yeah. So moving on to the apples, of course we tried lots of apple varieties. And in the end we liked two pounds of apples and a combination of tart apples and sweet apples because you really got a little more complexity of flavor. All right, so now we're ready to get cooking. And this is two tablespoons of butter. Going to put it over medium high heat. You can develop a lot of flavor on top of the stove. That's right. A little harder to do it in the oven. All right, so that butter is now melted and the bubbling starting to subside. Going to add the apples. We're not going to cook them for too long, only about five minutes, and they're just going to start to get brown and soft. All right, so these apples look pretty good. They've all got some slight browned edges, but they're not totally softened. They need to still have some texture on them, but they really got a nice head start cooking. Yeah. So I'm gonna turn the heat off. I'm gonna whisk this sauce together, of course, because the cornstarch has probably settled on the bottom. And the hot skillet will make the sauce bubble and the cornstarch thicken without the heat on. Mm. Oh, that smells good. So you can see this sauce is really nicely thickened up. The heat from the pan thickened the cornstarch. So we're gonna set this aside while we go get that dough that's been chilling out of the refrigerator okay. and roll it out. I like rolling it out right on the counter with a good amount of flour. And the best pie rolling out trick you taught me. <laughs> Were you gonna hit me in the head? I, I know, it came a little close to your face, didn't it? <laughs> was. <laughs> was to roll and spin. Yeah. Yeah, this way you get a nice round piece. What you're looking for is to roll it out to an 11 inch piece that can fit inside the skillet. Sometimes if it's getting a little out of whack and it's looking more like a square than a round, I just go around the edge. I don't know if you do this. Sort of retidy it. Mine's actually always perfect. Oh, yours are. Yeah. Oh, I heard yeah, that about one, you. If you believe that, you'll believe it. <laughs> Okay. That's about the size we're looking for. The biggest thing about this recipe in terms of being easy is you don't have to worry about double crust. It doesn't nope. have to exactly fit a pie pan. You don't have to trim it. That's right. So in the easiest way to get the crust on top of the apples, I like to put them down into a nice even layer. Brush off any flour. Roll it over the rolling pin, brushing out flour as you go. Loosely draping it. And of course just unrolling it right over the top. Perfect. Et voila. So we're gonna put a little egg white and sugar on the top. This is great for any pie. It makes a nice glossy, crisp crust on top. This is just one egg white. You know, we didn't really define what pan dowdy means. Dowdying is towards the end of the baking. They mm -hmm. used to actually take the crust and push it down a little bit yep. into the filling so the juices bubbled up over the top of the crust. And then we think they might have done that because crusts back in the day were really tough. And so you want to get them down in the juices to get them to soften a little bit. And so that was a little egg white, and this is a little bit of sugar over the top. Mm. All right, and then the last thing is sort of harkening back to that pan dowdy where the juices bubble up. We're gonna cut the dough into six pieces, and that leaves more sort of area for the juices to bubble up around without making the dough soggy. So I'm just gonna cut it once down the middle and then crosswise twice. So some of the juices will come up and sort of yeah. caramelize the top of the pastry. And that's it. She's done. That's easy. It's easy. So this is going to go into a real hot oven, 500 degrees. We really want to cook that crust and really get it nice and golden brown. So the higher part of the oven will do that for us. So that'll take about 20 to 25 minutes in that 500 degree oven. Doesn't that look awesome? It looks more than awesome. Yeah. So let's not talk too much. I want to get to <laughs> I know. this. So how long so does it again, cook? It baked for 20 to 25 minutes. You can take it out and you let it rest for 15 minutes for those juices to settle a little bit. I know you want a big piece, don't you? How'd you guess? <laughs> oh. Oh yeah. 
working here has Honestly. its advantages, oh, but yeah. this is one of the better days in the test kitchen. And the sauce on the crust, you kidding me? Mm. 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 Those apples have so much flavor. You know, my, my wife mm. always says we got to eat and I find a dessert I like. I keep my head down. I don't make eye contact with anybody and I don't <laughs> I... talk. This is really delicious. So the secret to a skillet apple pie, oddly enough, was using a skillet and you could saute the apples for flavor. You can add apple cider, maple syrup, lemon juice. You get a sauce, which you can't do in an apple pie. Don't have to worry about a bottom crust. Just use a top crust. It's simple. Rest 15 minutes and you're good to go. So there you have it from America's Test Kitchen to your kitchen. A fabulous recipe. Better than apple pie. Skillet apple pie. Oh, this is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm delighted to be rejoined by all these fantastic chefs and foodies. Let's have a toast. Cheers. 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 Great group. Cheers. Cheers. I am Cheers. starved. That's all I got to say. Cheers. Chin chin. Oh, okay. okay, come on, Jose. Oy. <laughs> wow. The listen, listen, delicious. guys. Let me stop you preoccupied with the liquid. I, I have some <laughs> solids here. Okay. What is that? The, well, these this? are What's the this? world's greatest grilled cheese sandwiches. Just taste it. Taste they it. look scrumptious. They, okay, these guys. Smell so mm. good. Mm. Why, and what, there's there's mm. a secret inside of there. Okay. May we it, know it? Wow. Uh, it's, there's some scallions. It, it, it's five different kinds of onions. Oh. Wow. Mm. Mm. They are so oh, that's wow. good. Mm. And Put it right this, here. This, no, is, listen, <laughs> we can, this is no work, but the next one I'm going to make you do a little bit of work here. Okay. Uh, okay. This is, um, I really like interactive appetizers. Oh, I, I, li I like to make the guests work. Yeah. So, no kidding. Uh, <laughs> I think it's a really good icebreaker when you've so, got people around and everybody's yep. serving you know, I, themselves. I don't know about you guys, but I love eating with my hands. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And you know, we have some, we might have some prim and proper people here, <laughs> but <laughs> I just love. Here, I'm, well, thank you. Okay, and pass it over here. Here, this is. Oh. Now and, you may find that these are a little bit spicy, and the reason that uh -huh. they're spicy is this is a sort of classic. Okay going curry but when i had the idea of turning it into finger food the first time i made them i very carefully seeded all of the chiles and then i got something in my eye ah. and I, uh -oh. I completely forgot i had these chiles on my hands uh -oh. and it, uh -oh. it, it, there is nothing more painful and there then I decided I would rather have the heat in my throat than in my eyes. <laughs> so now I don't take out the chiles, uh, the seeds or the veins or anything. Oh, wow. so, and, and just well, that's like where this. all the heat is. And it also it makes you drink more. No, it's not impossible. So well, who has the theory like about mm. starving your guests well. before yeah, dinner? Do you have that theory? Mm. Starving your guests before dinner? Well, that, that, for years, I thought you'd starve your guests. And by the time they got to dinner, they were so hungry mm. that, you know, they're going to eat everything, but these, these are so good, I have to now go back to my... Uh, my theory is, is you, you <laughs> give, give people that the best food right really right. early on. So good, that they're then, mm. they've then decided that dinner is going to be delicious no matter what you Absolutely. serve them. It doesn't yeah, matter. No, no, I love to serve really good, really flavorful bites right off the bat. And yeah. so everybody's like, it, they're in the mood for it. The you know? tone. It sets yeah. the tone. It sets the tone. And this is spicy. This is Absolutely. delicious. Well, you, this, you, this you've, you've converted me now. I mean, I have to go back to mm. hors d'oeuvres. These are phenomenal. Mm. Good. And, and, and I we have, make a lot of sandwiches. You cook I have to all say, those onions slow? Uh, you cook them all together. Yeah. I mean, you chop oh, them up really fine. And, you know, this you is know, such a perfect there's match. There's lots of great then. information shared here. But these guys can go on drinking so. forever and enjoying like this. Oh. I have to check on my pasta. Oh. So guys, mm -hmm. I'm going to check on the pasta. I know you're finicky, right. but you better come in the kitchen. Okay. okay. All, right. All right. We'll be right behind yeah. you. We'll be right there. Yeah. 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 One more. One more. Come on. Okay, I love guys. That kind of creamy quality that huh? it has. Do you like the it's creaminess? Super you know, there's delicious. many different versions of pesto in Italy, and this one happens to be mm. from Sicily. I yeah. love that the, you can taste the fresh tomato, right? The fact that it's not cooked well, sauce. It's so nice. The better they are, the more riper that the, they are, the better this this. But this could be a winter. Exactly, because you can get winter. nice little cherry tomatoes. Roasted tomatoes, even yeah. though I, I made this one with fresh one. Roasted tomatoes oh, would that's... bring that. Mm. Okay. How about if we move on to enchiladas? Okay, let's go for it. Oh. 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 Especiales estilo oh. Café Tacuba. 
Okay, oh, with a little right. bit of fresh cilantro. A little bit of chicken on the inside of them. Wow. And they've got a creamy sauce. It's sort of a, I'd say a European Mexican fusion. There's a bunch of spinach in the sauce too when it just comes I through. I thought you, I would find avocado in here. They're no, it looks like it avocado, but it's does. spinach that's oh, giving that color delicious. and that, that wonderful little taste. Oh, that listen, the chicken. Awesome. You get that gorgeous glow of the roasted poblano chili. And at the end, right, bit, exactly. Yeah. Like, like and then necklace. you get that richness that the spinach adds to it, sort of making it a sort of multi-dimensional mm. kind of flavor. The appetizers were amazing. The drinks, man, I mean, exceptional. The pasta, mwah, and this enchilada is mwah. unique. Mwah. I don't know what is gonna happen with my pork, really. Yeah, we're, we, we're a little concerned too. I'm gonna go for the pork, it's, it's waiting for me. Okay. okay, absolutely. Don't forget the salt. Señores uh. y señoras. Oh. Oh. Excellent. Now that looks like more than just pork and salt. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell me, tell me. Let me it. tell you, this pork loin makes no sense. I put a layer of the salt, I put the pork loin on top, I cover the pork loin with more salt. I have jamón serrano, the cured ham. Oh wow, it's the perfect garnish. So this is pork on pork. All right, so why, why don't I hold this for you? Go ahead. Okay, you, no, go ahead. You, 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 no, okay, you know how I'm gonna do this? Your fingers, I love this it. This dish is very it, Spanish, but I'm gonna eat it almost like it was a Mexican taco. Take a look at it. All right. You know, everyone's okay. getting, getting your on the Mexican honor, thing. Right? You're pulling my chain there, Jose. I, oh, yeah. Super moist and succulent. Uh, the great thing is we made pork loin, but actually fish, red snapper or any other fish whole, mm -hmm. it's also the best possible way to cook fish. The meat is cooking on its own flavor, on its own uses. And I wish everybody who thinks that pork is dry would eat this. It is so it's succulent. Okay. Now listen, this deserves... That, that is delicious. This. La, 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 la. you to do, wasn't it? Really? This drink mean, goes with almost every single dish we have. <laughs> You'll find by the fifth one, Jose, you'll be saying that often. <laughs> <laughs> Is it gonna go, we're gonna have to do a little dessert now. Oh, oh yes. yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. This is the moment. You actually can cook. Yeah, is it? <laughs> oh, well, you're amazing. And you too. <laughs> I will pass it on. Now, you know where this came from. This came in the 19th century. They didn't make two crust pies. They had pots over fires, and they cooked fruit or apples or anything else, and they just top it just with a down. crust. Sure, sure. And they'd press the crust down into the oh. fruit, and that was called okay. dowdying. Perfect for sex. Oh, okay. Hurry up, man. I'm getting my Hang mouth on. is it really, it really does. It really yeah. does start. look delicious. Yeah. And that's for you, sir, as well. Mm. It's really it's good. It's juicy. It's delicious. Mm. Amazingly good. It's crust. just wow. Chris okay. Well, well, I bow to you. <laughs> you know, I think we have here what five, six competitive spirits. No. <laughs> no. You know, I mean, really, people that know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So putting together, you know, I says, well, okay, is there going to be a little bit of that spirit of competition? Instead, it's all but. It's sharing, it's delicious, it's great food. And I guess this is the spirit of chefs, you know? Well, I would really like to propose a toast. This has been so much fun. I have enjoyed this movable feast enormously. And I really hope that this little feast has given everyone some ideas for having a great time with the people that you really love. Thanks, well, guys. If yeah. I can say on, on behalf of all of us, we hope that we've inspired a little bit of creativity on your part as well. And having a little movable feast of your own. Again, oh, really yeah. Yeah. Let's do it again. Yeah. For the next, movable feast two. <laughs> Okay, who washes the dishes? Yes. Yes. Okay. I want to see, see you. Okay, wash help me. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah.
This program has been a production of WGBH Boston in association with American Public Television.